Murphy Schiller and Wilkes has formed a simple purpose in mind, serving as a one-stop shop for the legal needs of developers, lenders, and others in the commercial real estate industry. Based in Newark, the firm's attorneys represent clients in the most complex real estate transactions and land development proceedings, as well as property taxation, environmental and real estate litigation matters, and in the acquisition, sale, and leasing of all real estate asset types throughout the country. Their attorneys have broad private and public sector experience coming from top national law firms and high-level governmental positions. Through the development of individualized client-focused strategies, their team works tirelessly to create a blueprint for success and advance their clients' interests in every matter. To learn more, head to murphyllp.com or give them a call at 973-877-6984. All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Greetings from the Garden State. I'm your host, Mike Cam. We are here in Morristown, New Jersey today at Glenbrook Brewery, a great friend of the show uh, with Steve Santucci. Steve, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for having me, and thank you for the wardrobe. So, like, if you're listening on, like, a listening platform, I would encourage you to either, like, go check out the YouTube version of this show or just, like, check us out on social media because I'm in full period specific clothes right yeah correct yeah, yeah right down to wow not well, yeah, my, yeah right like anything underneath yeah is that's yeah. me <laughs> well you got the shirt you right. got the period shirt you got the yeah. period waistcoat the you got the period military coat you got you are wearing a uh, style and knee breeches you got the socks and you also are wearing the period shoes yeah and i got my beer in this tin mug tin? Uh, absolutely yeah tin look nailed that and i know my medals i guess <laughs> um so i want to learn a little bit about you uh because like we've talked a bunch rolling through here at like different events we were co-judges at the chili cook-off for the two-year anniversary of glenbrook brewery um which was a lot of fun but uh i I feel like i don't know like a lot about you like in like your background uh so like tell me a little are you from jersey originally Uh, born and bred in morris county cool awesome so like where tell me take me through like young steve young steve was born uh i was born in dover in the hospital in Dover General. Okay. But uh, I grew up uh, until I was 18 in, on, in Jefferson on the Lake Opacon side, then moved into my late grandparents' house and lived there until I got married in 2001 and moved to Rockway. So, I mean, I'm yeah. born and bred. Right. Um, worked in and around Morris County as a teen in the pizza business, uh, Italian restaurants in Sparta. Then um, landed a job teaching in Madison, New Jersey. Uh, okay. I also went to college in New Jersey, County College and Drew University. I, yeah. Morris County is in my blood. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and it goes deep in the family <laughs> yeah, as well. Seriously. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I became a teacher. That's what I was went, went to college for. I became a history teacher, obviously, or I wouldn't be dressed up like this. Right. And I uh, got a job at Madison. That was short term, long leave replacement. Went to New Providence in Union County, but also had. Yeah, uh, it's literally 20 minutes from yeah, there. Yeah, it's nothing. And Rev War. It's everywhere I went, there was some Rev War that I was not aware of. Yeah. Um, but it was, at, it was at New Providence that I met a gentleman who's now in his 80s. He retired the year I started. He was a reenactor. Okay. A Rev War founding member of the unit, the second New Jersey I belong to since 1975. And um, he talked me into doing this, uh, dressing up on weekends and running around all over the 13 colonies. <laughs> yeah. So, so you joined in 1975? No. The unit oh, was, was say, you're not that old. No. Well, no. Pretty cool. Not that old. No. <laughs> Don't let the gray hair fool you. <laughs> uh, no, I was, um, I joined in 2000. Okay. At his um, pushing and urging. And uh, it was all downhill after that. I've right. kind of done everything that you could possibly do in the hobby Yeah. Uh, as far as the background <clears throat> organization. But um, it's he's a founding member of our unit that's still around. Uh, yeah. It's celebrating, going to be celebrating 50 years in 2024, which is incredible. Yeah. And we still have some of the founding members with us. Right. Um, but he, he, he talked me into it. In, in the spring of 2000, I met members of the unit, started getting my clothing, and started going out that year, and it just happened that I hit the 225th of the American Revolution. Okay. So I was getting into these big events. Yeah. Where hundreds, thousands, you know, you know, hundreds and hundreds of reenactors at these major events uh, throughout the United States, mostly, you know, of course, original 13 colonies. Sure. Right up through uh, 2008, 2009. Yeah. So it was an incredible time to get into the hobby. Right. So... Like when you were, I guess, you know, growing up through your career, like history teacher, obviously, because we said that, um, was like the American Revolutionary War, like a big, like 
like with like a, one of your huge interests, like I would imagine, or was it just like you got? Because I mean, there's Civil War stuff. Right. There's other stuff that you can get like really nitty gritty into. Um, like why this? Well, I always I always liked I always liked history, obviously. Yeah. And um, when I was a teen, I went to a uh, Civil War reenactment in Tuxedo, New York, at a history t- a village, and it was Union Confederate, and I really fell in love with the reenacting. Uh, and I had talked to some people, and I was 16, 17 years old at the time. And it was just expensive at that time. Not, yeah. not that any hobby is cheap. Right. I mean, I, I, <laughs> right. I, I get it. I yeah, imagine, right. Right? Yeah. <laughs> These things you know, aren't free. No. Uh, so it, oh, that bug always stayed with me and then got into working and college. So when it came time, like, I, didn't, I knew some stuff about the revolution, but nowhere near where I knew about the Civil War, World War II, which are always the two most popular sure. wars. Yeah. So... I, I just got involved in the hobby, and as I'm, as the years passed, I'm reading. Most of my reading is about the revolution. I'm going to symposiums about the revolution. I'm teaching the revolution. I got pigeonholed into that, yeah, because my background is mostly 19th and 20th century history. I'm teaching 18th century history. I'm teaching American Revolution. Everybody thinks because I dress up in these clothes. I'm the guy. Right. So I kind of I kind of grew into that role. Yeah. It's typecasting honestly. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but I just cuz dress like this, you might yeah. talk about World War II. Yeah. Jeez. Even yeah. my school IDs, I'm dressed up like this in the really? in, in the yearbook. I've yet to see it show up on social media. I'm kind of disappointed. That is pretty disappointing, yeah. honestly. We'll change that. Yeah. We'll work on that. Um, but uh, okay, cool. So you join up and you said there was a second New Jersey regiment, uh, Helms Company. Okay. Yeah. And is that like also, I would imagine something that's specific, like that existed in the Revolutionary War. It did. There yeah. were four New Jersey regiments r- raised. Uh, there was a fifth additional, which was like Spencer's fifth additional. Three really took the field for most of the war. Um, New Jersey was a deeply divided state. Uh, probably more served in the British cause than in the American cause in New Jersey. You know, deeply divided loyalties, almost like a civil war at times in New Jersey. Uh, the unit is specific to Helms Company, Colonel Helms's um, regiment. He was from Hackettstown, New okay. Jersey, buried in Hackettstown, and he was a miller. He was a, a prominent businessman. Um, the for the most of the war, it was command the brigade. All the jerseys were commanded by General William Maxwell. Originally born in Scotland, came to the United States as a young lad, served in the British Army, <laughs> left the British Army to join the American cause, and worked his way up to to a brigadier general. Yeah. And he's buried in New Jersey as well. Okay. Yeah, so uh, one, there's just really like maybe one fact that I know about the Revolutionary War was that more battles were fought in New Jersey than any other state. Is that right? That's the argument. But okay. also people in other states will say, well, it depends upon how you define it. That's true. But there were approximately 220 battle skirmishes and interactions, military interactions, during the course of the war. Right. And here in the yeah. state. In the state of New Jersey. Yeah, which is crazy that, like, you know, I mean, obviously, like, there's, it's between Philly, it's between New York, it's, you know. Uh, it, as Franklin allegedly said, it's like a cake tapped on both ends. Right. <laughs> he was a big drinker, too. And, and that's, you know, and we're here. So that, that makes yeah. a lot of sense. Um, so take me through, like, a little bit more about, like, let's do a little bit more history-related stuff. So, right. like, I know, because we're in Morristown, obviously, like, Glenbrook, like, one of their big things is kind of, like, trying to tie into, they have, like, Washington headquarters here and, like, a lot of the other people period specific stuff for like what Morristown has to offer like take me through maybe some of the stuff that you know like about Morristown and and you know its relationship to the war and all that yeah. well as as the war is growing Morristown becomes a very important place uh, it has if you've been ever to the town green it's one of the oldest I think in northern New Jersey that still existence and it's five major roads that intersect at the green mm-hmm. and those roads take you to New York to the Hudson River, the West Point area, and take you to Philadelphia and South. So that becomes very important for an army that's going to be in this area because it's a communications moves by way of road and supplies move by railroad and armies obviously move by railroad. So Washington comes here in 1777 after the Battle of Princeton and Trenton and disperses his army along around the community. They live in the homes of, of private citizens and yeah. public spaces. And he'll come back here in 1779 with about 10,000 troops uh, and will take up residence in one of the largest houses in the area. Um, And the army will be camped about five miles southwest of here. So so during the whole war, Morristown's an important 
a port in, uh, communications line between Philadelphia and, and upstate New York right. uh, to New England and even to the south. <laughs> yeah. So it's a major artery. Yeah. And because there's like, I mean, like I, I just notice, I mean, obviously you have like all the those historical landmark signs like around town, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And I know that you have obviously the headquarters, you have uh, Jockey Hollow there too. Um, but then there's like other like smaller, like the tavern, there was like a tavern in Morristown too. That was like, uh, like they would have like a lot of meetings there. That's where I, I hold yeah. my meetings in taverns as well. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's why we're here. Yeah. <laughs> it's period. Correct. Yeah. Right. Uh, Jacob Arnold was a local, uh, business owner. He owned a tavern and taverns back then were not just drinking places, but places you would stay when you're, when you're on, you know, traveling. Yeah. Um, Washington took up residence there in 1777. Uh, Jacob Arnold's Tavern was um, moved in the late 19th century off the green. It used to be across the street from the green in, in Morristown. It was moved. It was used as, like, you know, I think it was an orphanage, and it burned down around 1910, so we okay. lost that structure. Yeah. But there are, others, there are other places, like Fort Nonsense, yeah. which sits behind the county courthouse that dates back, the, the current structure dates back to the early 1800s. Um, that's where Washington allegedly had his men, you know, throw up earthworks. The joke, the common theme is that, oh, he did it because it was nonsense, you know, right. to keep them busy. But if you look on any day, uh, especially in the summer, on a, on a beautiful crystal clear blue day, you can see New York skyline. Yeah. And, and just imagine in 1777 or 79 when no army's here, you, the roads are dirt, so during dry season, armies on the march kick up dust. Yeah. So you can see 40 miles away. Right. And, and it's an important post you want to have. Yeah. And it's the highest point in Morristown. Yeah. Um, you have the Schuyler Hamilton House, which was Jabez Canfield's home. He was a doctor in the Army. And that is where, uh, for those who love Hamilton, and who doesn't, <laughs> Hamilton and, and his future wives, uh, they meet. He starts courting her there in Morristown. That's where the love story begins. Okay. So that's another house that's owned by the local chapter, the DAR, yeah. and they operate that house. Yeah. And so, like, when you're going through and doing, like, these, you know, reenactments and, like, all that kind of stuff, is it something where, like, you know a lot of, like, the history and the information, like, about these things that you're, like, doing? Like, all the stuff that you're telling me now, is that stuff that maybe, like, you wanted to know before you actually started doing this kind of stuff? Or was it stuff that, like, you learned going through and, like, actually participating in some of these events that we'll kind of get into a little bit later? For me, I learned as I went. And okay. I read. I read along. Uh, friends of mine in the hobby, you know, pushed me onto books to read, primary sources, secondary sources. And I read about them, talked to the historians who ran the historic sites. Uh, and, and that's where my knowledge comes. Some come in with that knowledge already. Sure. But I, I learned as I went and yeah. I grew. Was there anything, like, going through that where you were just like, holy shit, like, that is so, like, like things that stu stood out to you specifically, like, that, you know, piqued your interest, you know, maybe specifically about, like, stuff that happened in New Jersey or whatever, like, was it was something that you, like, learned while you were uh, participating in these things? Yeah, I, you know, being able to walk in the footsteps of Washington and that army and knowing what they endured for those, you know, eight years, that's the wow factor. Yeah. The biggest wow factor is actually being able to do these reenactments on the actual sites. Like, we're fortunate here in New Jersey that we have Monmouth Battlefield State Park, one of the most well-preserved battlefields of the American Revolution. Yeah. And one of the most critical battles of the war. So being able to go on that field and, right. and be able to walk on that ground, that yeah. sacred ground, is, is, that's the wow factor for yeah. a lot of reenactors. Even just doing, like, when I go, like, around and hike, like, Jockey Hollow, like, just doing that, it's like interesting you know like when they have like the you know the model uh, cabins that they have built out there and then just like knowing kind of that they, they were there it was just like a farmhouse i think it was right. uh like tempe wick is that tempe wick the temp temperance wick was the yeah. youngest daughter of henry wick okay and his wife yeah, she was the only one living with her parents at the time when the army came here in 7980 i always joke that because there's such a distance between her and her sisters or older sisters she was kind of like the social security of the 18th yeah. century <laughs> <laughs> taking care of mom and dad. Yeah, right. Uh, mom was, I think, 10 years younger. I think dad was may have been in his early 70s at okay. that point. Yeah. Um, so you, you have several f several property owners that have their land used by the Army. Yeah. Uh, and they're compensated financially for it. Uh, one of them was a loyalist. And he, uh, Peter, uh, Peter Kemble, 
a good portion of the army was on his. And he had a son-in-law that served in the British Army. His daughter was married to Thomas Gage, a British general, yeah. who was made famous for the Lexington Concord uh, events right. in Boston. Yeah. Uh, is allegedly he sent his wife home because she, he believed she may have been giving information to the <laughs> rebel side. Yeah. Um, so I want to go back to that, too, because you did mention before about, like, New Jersey being such like, a divided state when it came to, like, loyalists and, you know, people supporting the revolution. Like, was there a reason for that? Or was it just kind of like where, you know, people's heads were at at that point in time? It's no different to today okay. with our politics. It's a lot of it is politics. You could say, like, you know, I believe it was Adam said after the war, it was like, there were so many who were for, so many. It was like a third, a third, a third. It's more like 25% of the population was for independence. 25% was against it. 50% was on the fence, yeah. waiting to see the outcome. Which way the wind blows. Exactly. Yeah. And you could, you could dive down into the history and look at ethnicity. You could look at religion. You could look at politics. And you can see the breakdowns. Uh, you look at the, one of the wealthiest men in America as a rebel. Yeah, you would think, oh, he'd be conservative and want to keep the status quo. He'd be a loyalist, but it depends upon a lot of factors, right? Just like today. Yeah, and then you know, as uh, like, did and maybe this is a harder question to answer because obviously, like, you can't get in people's heads from two hundred plus years ago. But like, as more and more battles are f like fought, and you know, said like uh, battles, skirmishes, and what was. Uh, what was the other thing? Uh, military engagements. Okay, military skirmishes. engagements. So, like, doing those things, like, did that, like, having it so close to home, so to speak, did that start to shift, like, uh, maybe views on the revolution over time? It's like anything. You think about what, we, what we've seen in the last 20 years with two foreign wars. Right. You know, the first year or two, everybody's patriotic behind it. And then as it drags on and there's no end, end in sight, you lose interest. Or you, you see by 2008 here in the United States, there was the anti-war movement. Yeah. You saw it with Vietnam. Believe it or not, I, if World War II went on another year, you'd probably start to see the same thing. Right. Um, in the American Revolution, I know people are not going to be thrilled about this, but there were comments made by General Nathaniel Green, who was the quartermaster general while he was here, complaining about the local inhabitants kind of turning sour on supporting the cause. And you even see it as early in the war with Thomas Paine's uh, Winter Soldier and Sunshine Patriot, he who, you know, shrinks from their duty. Uh, you know, nothing ever important is done, is this, you right. achieve, e you know, easily. Right. It's, it's how much in it. So by 7980, the inhabitants in this area, which were pro-war, were pro, pro, you know, independence, were, you know, we want the war to be over. We want our lives to go back to normal. Yeah, just burned out at that point. Exactly. Yeah. And and not realizing that, you know, it, it does take a lot of sacrifice on the home front. Right. Yeah. I mean, so I think what we're going to do is we're going to take our first break, mm -hmm. or actually our only break of this episode, uh, because I do want to get into more stuff that, like you do now with, like, all the reenactment stuff and everything. And I'm sure we'll touch on to, like, some more historical things of significance as we kind of progress. But uh, so this is the Greens from the Garden State podcast. I'm Mike Cam. We're here in Morristown, New Jersey, at Glenbrook Brewery with Steve, Stantu Steve Santucci. We'll be right back. Bored of going to the same park? Want to try a new local adventure? Well, then check out NJSpots.com, your home for finding a new spot to discover right here in New Jersey. With dozens of maps to check out, local hiking spots, family-friendly places, and seasonal suggestions, NJ Spots is waiting for you to find somewhere new to explore. That's NJSpots.com. The Mayo Performing Arts Center is the heart of arts and entertainment in Morristown, New Jersey. MPAC presents over 200 events annually and is home to an innovative children's arts education program. To see MPAC's upcoming schedule of world-class concerts, stand-up comedy, family shows, and more, head to mayoarts.org or just click the link in our show notes. All right, we're back for segment two of this episode of Greetings from the Garden State. I'm Mike Cam. We're here in Morristown, New Jersey at Glenbrook Brewery with Steve Santucci. So in the first segment, we learned a little bit about uh, your background. Uh, we've got like a little bit of a history lesson about the Revolutionary War and its you know, time here in Morristown in New Jersey, um, and a little bit how what you do as a reenactor relates to that. Um, can we talk about like the clothes real fast? Absolutely. Because like, I'm wearing it, so I yeah. want to know, like, I mean, I know we mentioned like what it is exactly that I'm wearing, but I do think that it would be good to know, like, like, why does your jacket have that thing on it and mine doesn't? Right. For those who are, are listening, he's pointing to an epaulet on my left shoulder, which yeah. is silver braid, and that means I'm an officer. Uh, I wore this at the Battle of Princeton this past year, so I was an ensign, which made me equivalent to like a lieutenant. And usually that's the sign of rank. Okay. You'll have a, 
Uh, green is for private, red is for sergeant, and then silver, depending upon what shoulders are on, or if you have one or two, we'll tell you what rank. Yeah. Then when you get to the gold, you're talking colonels, generals on up. Right, and then I guess that's like the equivalent, like a modern day, like stripes or medals or correct. whatever. Yeah, the stripes. Yeah, yeah. correct. Um, yeah. And then is does the hat have any significance? Like uh, you have like what is that a bow on your hat? So I have what you don't have. I have on mine is a cockade on the left side. And it's black, and that's actually um, a military item. Yeah. In 1778, when we signed the alliance with, with France, they joined the war, we would put a white cockade. The white symbolizes the French flag. Okay. So I'm pre-1778 I, I pre with got the it. cocked hat. Uh, it's, it's got tape or white trim on it. Uh, British, British hats had white trim. People think all British units wore the same, same exact kind of clothing, but they didn't. They yeah. wore, depending upon what regiment they came from or what was their specialty, like, you know, infantry, we call them line or hat companies. Then you have your life lights or light infantry. Then you have your grenadiers and you have your dismounted and then you have your mounted troops. So they all wear clothing according to what their specialty was. Just right. similar to the American. Sure. Yeah. As well. Um, okay. And then moving down, because like sure. we did talk about some of this other stuff. Right. Uh, let's hope like this, um, the tie. The cravat. The, the cravat, cravat or the or the neck stock. Okay. So it's like kind of like the granddaddy of the of the tie. It the the shirt that I'm wearing underneath is a V cut that goes down to just the, just about my sternum. Mm. So to cover up that, you know, the beautiful chest hair that right. I have or you yeah. have, <laughs> it would cover that up. <laughs> Um, Mine the, flows for sure. The higher the rank, the more fancier the cravat would be. Okay. Militarily, they would wear a, a leather stock or a leather band around their neck that would kind of push their head up. You know, hence head, the name Leathernecks yeah. comes from for the for the Marines because they wore them. They're usually made of leather or horse hair. Um, but I wear a silk one. It's the fanciest item. It's the old one of the oldest items I have on my body in reenacting. I've had okay. it for 23 years along with the hat I'm wearing. Yeah. Cocked hat. Um, then next, you have your waistcoat. I have a sleeved waistcoat on. You're wearing a sleeveless. Right. Sleeveless. Thank God, because I'd sleeve. be sweating my ass exactly. off right now if I had the sleeve one on. <laughs> Mind you, we're wearing wool coats. Yeah. Both lined with linen. Right. Uh, but we're wearing linen, which is a period correct clothing uh, material back then. So is wool. Yeah. Um, and then I'm wearing knee breeches that are made of linen. And then wool stockings that go up past my knee with gaiters or garters. Uh, garters to keep them from falling down. And then 18th century style shoes, leather shoes. Right. Uh, you're wearing uh, more of a, you your knee bridges you're wearing go a little past your knee, but they have ties on the sides instead yeah. of buttons like mine. And then you're wearing just about the same thing. Got it. Yeah, yeah the the, uh, the stockings were whatever because like, that's like a baseball thing for me. Yeah. Like, so it was like, put it on, you know, baseball socks. Um, but uh, so like I'm wearing this and is this something that, like, a Revolutionary War soldier, would I, like, put this on every morning to get ready to, like, go into battle? So what we're wearing underneath the regimental, we call this the coat, the okay. red-faced blue coat, is yeah. a regimental. That's military issue. That's Got government it. issue. Everything else is what we call small clothes. Most times during the American Revolution, that's the clothes you wore. Yeah. Th those are your, your personal clothing. Right. Uh, the there was like in the Pennsylvania line they did issue waistcoats with peas on them. They've shown up in archaeological remains, in, in encampments, but for the most part, the only thing that makes it uniform is the actual regimental, the coats that you and I are wearing. Okay, right now. so so this is like civilian clothes. Everything yeah. else under you is typical civilian clothing. Got it. And or then, an example of it. Right. Um, and so like when you're getting like putting this stuff together and like you know you said my hat was handmade. Yes. And, like, is all this stuff, like, you just, like, I'm assuming you could just buy it someplace? Or do you, like, make some of this stuff? Uh, some make. Okay. If they have the skill to sew, there are some yeah. that hand make, hand sew. The knee bridges I'm wearing are hand sewn by a friend of mine who actually works for Jim Henson Studios. Oh, cool. So she hand sewn uh, a few of my articles of clothing. Uh, some are very good at it. You get machine stitched. You know, different units have different requirements. Do people look down on machine stitch? Like, pfft. That's well, not period specific. Like all my hobbies, you know, <laughs> all my hobbies, you always have the like purest. Like diehards. Yeah, yeah, it's the diehards. Right. It's like you can build it out of the box or do you do you take it off the rack? Yeah, yeah. It, it depends. I really, I have a mix. Okay. It's it's a matter of, you know, it gets expensive. This is one of the more expensive hobbies because it's a smaller in population. We do have sutlers or people who 
who sell items. Yeah. Um, you can find people who can make the items for you. That's where you get a little more expensive. I mean, the shoes that I'm wearing, I won't buy modern shoes for less than eighty dollars. Well, for more than eighty dollars, <laughs> yeah, right. I find it ridiculous. But I was gonna say, I'll, I'll drop okay, one hundred fifty shoes. Yeah. One hundred fifty on a pair of eighteenth-century leather shoes. I don't blink an eye at, and that's without the buckles. <laughs> yeah, and there are some you can have them made right to your foot. Right, and it feels like you're not wearing shoes, and those can run you five hundred dollars because they're handmade. Yeah, what's the deal with the the metal on the bottoms? So the that heel makes it, has the like a, almost like a horseshoe on the bottom. You have like a horseshoe. That's a steel. Uh, it's to give you. Kind of traction, okay. Not on on the surfaces right. that we're used to walking on, but on like dirt roads, yeah, fields. Sure. Okay, yeah, that makes more traction. sense. I don't have any on my shoes. Yeah, trying to go up a grass hill, it's it's like going they, up I mean, a slide. Got, yeah, they got no tread on them exactly. or anything. They're just like flat. Yeah. Um, and so, like, okay, let's go back to like. Uh, so we got the clothes. We show up to an event, right? Take me through kind of like. So maybe we'll do some of the events that people can participate in because I know we, we talked about a couple that are even coming right. up because uh, this episode is going to post like late April. So uh, some, most of the ones that we talked about are going to be after that. Right. I'm sure they go yeah. on every year anyway. So, you know, because they're uh, anniversaries of different things. Right. But so what, what are some of those events? So we have Jockey Hollow Winter, the spring and camp coming up in the third week of April, April 21st, 22nd, or that full weekend. Reenactors show up on a Friday. We set up our camp. We're usually a mix of like period clothes or in, in modern clothes. We set up the next morning, we get up, we're dressed, we do inspection, we go through the whole thing. You know, we were using real firearms, so the men go through the, the musket men go through their drill and their practice, this go through safety. You know, we start to campfires early in the morning because it takes time to get good cooking coals. Yeah, and we're doing whatever the site requires of us or what we have scheduled. You know, we could do drill like spring and camp. We're going to demonstrate the drill and how the men uh, maneuvered on the field and firing the muskets. So everybody likes the boomsticks to go off. Yeah. So usually that draws the largest crowds. Right. You know, we could have a thousand. Uh, come through a day at Jackie yeah. Hollow when we have the spring and camp at like two or three thousand for the weekend. So for much larger events like the Battle of Monmouth, which is Father's Day weekend this June, which is the 245th anniversary. Wow. And we're getting close to the 250th. Yeah. Uh, the numbers I just recently saw are looking very strong on the American side. We're hoping the British show up so we have somebody to play with on the field. Yeah. But again, that, you know, we'll show up on Friday. Camp will go up. And then Saturday, it's like we'll have uh, we'll have our reveille. We'll have our inspection. The men will go through drill. Uh, then we'll get ready for the battle and right we'll do the battle each is it, day is it hard to get guys to come out to be like hey be a british that everyone hates you not that everyone hates the british in case anybody the british listens to this show but like but to be the enemy in that reenactment they're they're by scale smaller in numbers than than the american side yeah but they're they're out there okay I've actually done the British side, and I've got to say, wearing the British uniform, I tend to have my chest up higher. I feel like <laughs> I am I am imperial, and yeah. I'm powerful, and I feel like everybody should be kowtowing to me right. in that sense. Yeah. So I've, I've played on the other side, and it's... it's it's interesting. It's another perspective. Yeah. How 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 it's run over there. Because it's, it's almost like seeing like all this stuff that you're so engrossed in. It's like seeing it from just like a different lens. I would imagine. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And uh, like because you said like going through and like walking in the same footsteps as you know a Revolutionary War soldier. What what no matter what side like it's a, such a different experience you know for anybody that's involved in that. A absolutely, and it, it is humbling. And and we're very respectful. Uh, we're very guarded of the history. Yeah. And uh, we're very well researched. A lot of the reenactors are very researched and even authored books. Okay. And articles and continue to do so. Yeah. Um, and then so uh, what are some other events? Because I know like the one that I do want to ask about is uh, the Christmas Day one, like the crossing of the Delaware. Yeah. Can we talk about that one? Absolutely. So they've been, it's one of the, it's, it has to be one of the longest running reenactments of the revolution in the United States. It dates back... I think to the 1930s. Yeah. They cross on Christmas Day, during the day, obviously, not at night like Washington did, and uh, row across the Delaware um, at about in the after, early afternoon. We, they do a dress rehearsal earlier in the month so that everybody's, you know, prepared for Christmas Day. But everything's weather dependent. It's also um, the, the river, how fast or how low it is, depends on who we cross. We didn't cross this year because the river was high right. and it, it was, was fast. Yeah. Um, and that's disappointing, but at least we had the rehearsal to do that. Yeah. Um, it's, I did it in 2014 for my first time. It was incredible. And I belonged to a, a boat crew 
an 18th century boat crew that has a private boat. We do both British and American interpretations. And it was incredible to do it because we're the first boat to go across. Cool. We take the advance card. Yeah. So I've done it uh, four times now. And I even got the manager of the brewery here to go across who I think he loved it. Yeah. Um, and he even got him kitted out with much of the clothes <laughs> you're wearing. It, it, but it's incredible. Yeah. It's the sea. Like, I sit in the boat for most of the day, and we're, like, 20, 30 feet below the on the Pennsylvania side. Right. And when we cast off to see hundreds, not, not hundreds, thousands of people on the Pennsylvania side and almost that many on the Jersey side. It's just an incredible feeling that yeah. they're all here to kind of see history, but you also get a feeling, oh, they're seeing me as well. Right. <laughs> exactly. Like you're the star of the show. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then because like, that's so cool, like doing something like that, um, just because of like how obviously like significant it is because of like all the, you know, obviously like the, of the battle, like the implications of like what was going on in the war, but then just like, you know, all the pictures and like all that kind of stuff, but then to actually do it, it's got to be like awesome. Is the boat also period specific or it, are you like it is okay it's, the boat itself is an antique by it like a flat bottom boat or something like that yeah it's called a bateau they were first introduced in the french and indian war in the 1750s early 1760s up up in upstate new york in the great in the finger lakes and up on like champlain uh it's flat it so it can carry heavy cargo and men yeah but it steers like a log <clears throat> Um, it's it's slow at times. What was impressive during the rehearsals, I saw a video of someone f- filming us from the time we left to the time we arrived on your side. It took four minutes, which unloaded, by the way. That was our return after we had unloaded our eight or nine soldiers. And that was pretty impressive yeah. with five oarsmen, which three were n- inexperienced. Right. So that was pretty impressive. But, uh, yeah, I, I love the boat. The Bateau Moon's a great boat. It's been around since 1996. The owner is a Jersey guy. He's... You know, retired military and a school teacher, a history teacher, and a, and a tech teacher. Yeah. Uh, and we we work on the boat because it you know it needs upkeep. It's <laughs> we say. try to do everything that's Merry 18th Christmas. century to it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's got to be ready for Christmas. Yeah, um, that's awesome. And so like when people uh, like want to get involved in something like this, like how how does that process work? The well, first thing I ask: Have you ever gone camping? Right. And like what kind of camping? You got glam camping, you got hotel camping. I grew up in the 70s and 80s. I was a scout in the 80s. We had fathers who were Korean War, Vietnam War vets. We were using, like, wedge tents with no bottoms, yeah. sleeping in January. So right. I was kind of prepared when I walked into it for reenacting. Yeah. Y- you got to be ready for that. Does that mean that that precludes you? No. On the British side, they disappear. Some of them disappear from camp. We find out they're in hotels. So I've done the hotel thing, too, at certain events, long distance with family. Yeah. But if you like the outdoors, you're okay with sleeping on the ground, eating out of tin kettle, eating out of a, you know, out of period correct food, boiled beef. I grew up on boiled beef, so I'm re- I was ready for it. Right. So you're like you're going like all the way down like that specific. Yeah, we try yeah. we try to give as much. Um, it, it differs between units. Sure. Uh, like our unit tries to make it as period correct, whatever was available that time of year, season wise. That's what we're going to eat. So it's yeah. usually boiled beef and root vegetables. Yeah. That's cool. So then, like, uh, so from there, okay, let's just say they've they've been camping, like, they do, like, the, you know, the lean-to tent, and they sleep on the ground, like, whatever. Um, then, like, so anybody can do it? As long as... I could be like, hey, I'm coming. Yeah. yeah. Well, you, usually what you need to do is you need to join a unit. Okay. Uh, find a unit that's local to you that has interest, and sometimes not every unit is for everyone. depends upon what they're looking for. Right. What does that mean is that you, you join a unit as a member, you're covered by insurance because okay. there are liabilities sure. and things well, like yeah. that. And that also means that, you know, they'll work, walk you through it. It's a big investment. Yeah. So they could always have loaner clothes to get you ready. I mean, I loan, I was loaned equipment until I, you know, knew that this is what I wanted to do yeah. and could invest more money into it. Right. Yeah. So it's, there's, there's over 80 rev war units uh, in the hobby yeah. on the American side alone okay. and maybe maybe 60 on the British side. And then, so, uh, so we're talking about like all these different units and, and everything and, you know, doing these different events. Um, I would imagine most of them participate in as many events as they can, right? A- absolutely. Yeah. Like we have, I, I just, um, just talking about having done a lot of things in the hobby. I was the, I was the chairman of the Connell kind of Line, which is one of the largest organization, umbrella organizations. Yeah. And there are three umbrella organizations. There's the Brigade of the American Revolution, which is the oldest and the founding uh, organization. Then there's the Connell kind of Line that was formed in the mid-80s and the British Brigade. 
that handles the British side. So we have an annual meeting once a year okay. where we disseminate all that information of what events are coming out. And then the units have their own meetings where they vote on what events they're going to go to. So they could take it out to Ohio, to Canada back in the early 2000s, even as far as Puerto Rico and St. Augustine in Florida. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. And then um, what is, so I, I asked about the, uh, the crossing event. What is, do you have a favorite event? Is that it? Is there like another one that you love? Oh, that's tough. Um, like if they're like, Steve, sorry, you can only do one event this year. Like which one are you going to pick? Well, that's real tough. There's one event. There's going to be a lot of people who might be. Probably the crossing. Okay. Because we I feel show, like that's like so unique it is. to some of the other things it is. that you do. It's very unique because we do it on the actual day. We're not doing it at night, but it's still, it's still so right. unique. Yeah. Um, that would be the one. And it's tough because I'm away from the family all day. It's yeah. all, I, I get up there. It's at, Christmas. I wake them up. Kids. Yeah. My kids are older now, so right. you know they're hard to get up. But they get up. They give me an hour. I leave around 8. I'm there by 9.30, 10 o'clock. And then it's just wait and wait and wait. And then we ship off around 1 o'clock, rowing yeah. across. And it's like you know 45 minutes and we're done with right. the crossing. Yeah. So, um, which I think is just so cool. And, like, that's, I remember Connor had asked me about, like, you know, because you had mentioned something to him, and then, but I was like, it's Christmas. My mother will actually, like, slay me. Yeah. What's up, Mom? Um, but, uh, so, like, going through all these things, like, uh, I would imagine, like, that's helped, you know, because I'll, like, I'll, I'll be in, ask an honest question. Like, if someone sees you walking in here, like, wearing this, they're like, what the fuck? I'm sure, like, when these people just walked in and they're watching us yeah. on microphones wearing this stuff, talking to each other, like, what the fuck is that? Yeah. You know? Well, like, it's funny because we're here in the in the brewery and it's open and wh- who the first customer that walks in is a former student of mine yeah. who he's like, I'm yeah. not surprised. Like, literally, he's like, like, didn't even bat an eye. Didn't, didn't yeah. bat an eye. <laughs> uh, and, and you know what? It, during different parts of the year, Morristown, when I come in here dressed up like this to help out the brewery, yeah. people don't bat an eye. Yeah. It's Morristown. You right. kind of expect it after a while. <laughs> yeah. You see those guys talking on the green every yeah. day. Yeah. 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 The statues. The statues. <laughs> yeah, right. um, I, I get shouted out because of the gray hair or the white hair. They're like, oh, look, it's George Washington. That happened when we were doing the uh, Chili Fest here. I was yeah, like, yeah. walking here and it was like, oh, look, it's George Washington. I'm like, yeah. no, no, no. Don't call me George. Right. Because you don't have the exactly, and I don't. Yeah. Look, I'm, and George is sacred, you know, he's right? A sacred entity in that case, but yeah, yeah. Um, it's interesting. Do would a revolutionary soldier have a beard like mine? No, no, actually, um, that's an interesting question. It is a great question. Would they have hair like yours? Yeah, right. Long hair, yes. Um, long hair tied back. Okay. If no, 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 you're bald. Right. You, you would have a wig. You would not have facial hair unless you were one of the German. Mercen- you know, okay. German German soldiers had facial hair. Yeah, Washington had standing orders that men would be clean shaven every three days. Okay, part of it is hygiene. Part of it is to look uniform. Um, so that's that's an issue that goes back to the 1970s when this hobby really took off for the bicentennial. Is that you look at photographs from the 70s? There's a lot of guys in the 70s with beards. And yeah, it's something that's a difficult choice. You know, I choose to shave. My son has a full beard. He shaves. A day or two before the event, right? Okay. He knows yeah. dad. Dad's Respect. orders is, exactly yeah. right. You know they'll look the part, yeah, and, and they get it. Um, but it's but to be historically accurate, that's one of the things you have to consider. Is gotcha uh, is the is the beard? Yeah, because right now you look like a pirate. You look yeah, like I feel like beard. a pirate. You look like brown beard, literally. Actually, yeah, yeah. like I could like, literally <laughs> jump like on a, a ship or like if they had a rope, yeah. like these lights that they got up here, yeah. I could just like swing across yeah, the thing. Absolutely, in here. yeah. I but, should have brought a sword for you. It would have been fitting. You yeah, look literally, like a, like a big like swashbuckler yeah. kind of sword. But then you mentioned the stuff. What was the the uh, sailor slops? Sailor slops. Yeah. Like if I had those, you would be closer. You would be closer to a quote pirate. Yeah, I, it's incredible. <laughs> I've walked into, like, restaurants. We, we'll go out on Friday night, and we'll, some of us will be dressed, and I'll walk into a restaurant, and I'll be like, oh, look, a pirate. And I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so that does lead me to the other question is, uh, like, when you, I guess, were dating your wife, so you said you started this in 2000 and married yeah. her in 2001. 2001. Yeah. So she was undeterred, right? She was like, well, I love Steve, so I got to, th- this is part of our life now. Yeah. Did she, you realize like the level that it was going to maybe get to? Like you, we're going out to dinner. I told you to get, get dressed up and you dressed up like this. Yeah, she did. <laughs> it was funny because she came to an event 
when we were dating, and she looks over and she goes, that's my dad's best friend, who was one of the founding fathers of my unit, okay. Charlie Prestopine, who was yeah. funny at my wedding. He was at my wedding, and my sister was like, why is my history teacher, high school history <laughs> teacher at my, at my brother's wedding? And I'm like, because small world. Yeah. Um, she liked history. She's a math. Her dad liked history, and he was in the math, but yeah, she's, it's my thing. Right. It's her thing. When I turned third, I think it was 40, when I turned 40, she surprised me. Uh, she conspired with the women in the unit, and she got period dressed up and showed up to an event, and oh, it was cool. very weird. Yeah, it was like, weird. you're in my world. It's yeah, like me right. showing up to her choir and singing. That's, yeah. you know, in the, in the baritone <laughs> section, it would be yeah. weird. But it was great because she supports it. Yeah, um, a lot of pe- friends of mine that I work with, teaching wise, like, how did your wife let you get away with being away so many weekends of the year? I go because she doesn't have to deal with me. I also take right. the kids now. Okay. So she's one or two even better. kids less. It's yeah, even right. better. Yeah. They're into it. Yeah. So um, it, it works. Yeah. No, it's great. She knew what she... And she's gotten to some events as a tourist. You know, we've traveled to Williamsburg or yeah. some other places. She'll come to Monmouth or Jockey Hollow for the day. Right. As a tourist. Yeah. And so, like, when people do as a tourist, like, because you mentioned, you know, like, people come out to these events and they watch, like, is there... Like, you just show up and you watch this... Like, whatever the reenactment thing yeah. is, like, you cross, and then it's over. Or right. is it there more, like, of a, a more event surround around it? Yeah. Like, a Jockey Hollow in, a- in late April, you know, there will be an area where people can watch the firing demonstrations, but the camps are open for people to walk about and talk to any of the reenactors. We love to talk, obviously. Yeah. Uh, battle reenactments like Monmouth in late June, uh, Father's Day weekend this year. Uh, the camps will be open. There'll be activities in the camps for people to see and witness, and then there will be a viewing area for them to watch the battle. Yeah, yeah. very cool. Um, did you bring anything else? Like any other stuff? Um, I did. I, it's amazing what you can find when you don't put on the clothes for a while. I did pull out <laughs> two items. I was like, oh look, I have like, oh, my shit. mechanical pencil, which is a porto crayon. It's, okay, it's brass and it's got graphite or lead back yeah. then, but it's got graphite for writing. Sure. Um, but and I also that's have, like a real, like, people back then used that. Uh, yeah, you would find it would be upper class, okay. yeah. Or you just have a piece of lead. Yeah. Um, it's more fancy. I have a, um, it's a tool that soldiers would have. It's It's got a hammer. It's bent for a hammer. It's got a pick for the vent of the musket, and it's got a screwdriver. So it's a three-in-one tool. That's oh, like the right. original Swiss Army knife. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and there were many different kinds and styles that were around that time, but I just stuck my hand in my pocket. Oh, that's where it was. Yeah. Um, so I think my last question, or maybe not my last question, because we are getting close to the end of this, yeah. but um, you mentioned like uh, guys doing uh, like live rounds, like with the guns and the muskets and all that kind of stuff. Do like guys have those and like bring them to like gun ranges and be like, I'm going to shoot this thing. Like, so you have like people using like modern day guns and then like next to a guy shooting a musket at like a target. Do they right. do that? Yeah, I've I've actually live fired once a okay. musket to just get a sense of what it felt like when a musket ball coming out. It does have a little kick. Yeah. I know some guys that hunt with them. I mean, they are really? black powder. They okay. make a lot of noise. Yeah. Uh, but m- I would say 95 to 99% of the reenactors, they just use them for blowing. We, all we do is put a paper cartridge full of black powder down the barrel. Okay. That's it. We do go through, for those who are concerned, we do go through safety checks. Yeah. Um, I wasn't we, even concerned. Yeah. I was like, do people actually, like, go and, yeah, like, some shoot do. this thing off? And, yeah. And, and people are hard to believe we would say, these are real firearms. Right. Um, we take care of them. Yeah. Uh, we are very cautious, safety-wise, very conscious of that. Because we don't want anybody to get hurt. But we want, we want to have them, we want the public to have a sense of what it was like. Sure. So, makes yeah. It, yeah, it definitely yeah. makes it more real, for yeah. sure. Yeah, I know, like, Cabela sells the, the, there's one, it's made in Italy, Petersoli's the company, they make the British and the French muskets. Oh, wow. So, yeah, and they're not cheap, because it's coming from Europe. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, they're real firearms. Yeah. And we treat them like that. Right. Well, of course. Um, Well, so this has been amazing. Uh, I do want to see if there's, like, anything else that maybe we missed, like, anything that you think is, like, a good New Jersey-specific topic to talk about, or maybe something that just, like, with what you do, with what maybe you want to leave people with, like, a, a final point from from Steve. The final point is um, New Jersey is an incredible state in its history, especially with the revolution. It, it, unfortunately, like some had said, we're like a barrel tapped at both ends. We got Philadelphia and New York. We compete with them. But a lot of history happened here. You know, there was a Washington spent a lot of time in New Jersey. There are a lot of houses in northern New Jersey that still stand that he stayed at. You know, there's 
Ford Mansion here in Morristown, Dye Mansion in Wayne, New Jersey, and there's a, a number of them throughout northern New Jersey. Yeah. And just know that, you know, New Jersey was indeed a crossroads of the revolution. Between New York and Philadelphia, a lot happened in New Jersey. Divided loyalties, resources. So the next time you're out and about in New Jersey, just remember, you never know what you'll find around the corner. Yeah. And a lot of history will be around that corner. Awesome. Love that. That was a great last point. It's like you have your own podcast. So, um... If people want to learn more about what we're talking about, um, like what you do, all that kind of stuff, like where are some places that maybe they can go to do that and get more information? Well, you can look at our unit in particular. It's two, the number two, nj.org. And we have our our calendar of events we do, which is a lot of New Jersey-centric. There's the Connell Line. They, we have a website, just Google Connell Online, the Brigade of the American Revolution, the British Brigade. And those umbrella organizations will lead you to events that are going around, not only in New Jersey, but around the country, mostly in the East Coast, obviously. Got it. Uh, and that from there, you hit... Uh, parks like Monmouth Battlefield State Park has a website. Morristown National Historical Park has a website. And you so, can find like the schedule for these events yeah. and like, all that kind of stuff there as yeah. well. And check out social media. Just yeah. Google those names and then you'll find out. Awesome. Love it. Well, Steve, this has been great. Thank you so much for doing this episode with me for the close. I appreciate Absolutely. it. We're going to have to take some pictures before we get out of here. Um, but uh, I'll make sure I put those links in the show notes so people can go check it out. If they want to even just go, like, go to an event, like make a yeah. day out of it, have some fun, you know, and know that they can just come up to you and ask you some questions or meet you or whatever. So, uh, or you're here with me. Absolutely. If I'm yeah. dressed in Glenbrook Brewery, please come up and ask me a question. Yeah, exactly. So uh, thank you, everybody, for listening. So this has been the Greetings from the Garden State Podcast. Uh, I'm Mike Ham. We are here in Morristown, New Jersey today at Glenbrook Brewery with Steve Santucci. Thank you for listening, and we will catch you next time.